started to work with clocks prior to working on my Venice installation, and the clock, of course, you know, time, well, it's such a factor of our lives, and time is, uh, time's like a piece of elastic and a piece of chewing gum where you can pull it out of your mouth and, you know, shape it in, in all sorts of ways. The, the clock was a great object, really, a, a physical object uh, upon which to express uh, in large part in my installation, my, my fears and my sadness and, and a certain amount of sarcasm, you know, in some of the works about the, the times that we live in and an outlook on our not so distant future potentially. And the clocks also have an audio aspect to them, which I think is an important part of the installation. And they're all going at random. So there's this kind of, you know, chimes and cuckoos and, you know, so there's that sense of time passing, but almost in the way of chaos theory where the rhythm of it uh, has sort of been deconstructed by the, the randomness of, of, of having a lot of clocks in the one space. It's chaos, but it's also madness as well. It's cool. Well, exactly, yes. And I think the, the clocks are almost like a sounding bell for, for time passing and, and our mindfulness of, uh, of that in the dark times that... I mean, most people would, I think, agree that we are in fairly gloomy times. You'd have to be living in a vacuum, I think, not to, not to think that. And then the chaos and the madness presented in cabinets as well. So the cabinet is obviously, it's an ordering yeah. technique, but it's... Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think the cabinets, I mean, I'm, I'm a museum junkie. I love going to museums, particularly, I mean, I like going to art museums, of course, but, you know, uh, for my personal research, all sorts of other museums, uh, and, and often some of the earlier ones from the 17 and 1800s, where you see, you know, things from the outside world distilled in, uh, in a vitrine. And often those displays can, they can have a logic in the way that, you know, the work is displayed, but an absence of logic in the choices about what was thrust together. You know, particularly some of the earlier ones, which are more like the Cabinets of Curiosities and, and the Wunderkammer, where there's a, almost a sweeping up at random of, you know, different fascinating, you know, objects that are thrown together. Uh, but, but also the idea of, you know, Museology is a way of categorising the outside world as if to, ca to categorise it neatly and to place it in a vitrine actually encapsulates what the, the real world is about. And that's something I draw upon a lot as well. In, I think in much of my work, I mean with the bird's nest for example, you know, they're made from actual nests of actual species. But there's, there's, there's a very studied artifice, you know, in the way even in a museum they might be displayed but you know then for me as an artist to use that as a springboard and then I think you know particularly with the, the, the bread on the atlases which is one of the most recent works there's that sense of you know the the, the chaos uh, of the world you know that's come together but there's no there's no rhyme or reason really there's there's a, there's every reason for each object that that was chosen that's on an open atlas page, but there's no connection except that they're all representatives of uh, facets and uh, details of our world. There's no, there's no ordering there, and I think that's one, you know, the, the museum and, and, and the cabinet signifies order, but to present order in, you know, in a way that then signifies disorder, I think is what, probably the best way that I could say, you know, what I'm trying to do. Um, in that work. So the Chumpy Desert Weavers, this idea of animals from another time, could you describe working with them and sitting there and talking with them and what you were talking about? Uh, yeah, the Chumpy Weavers, I was, I was invited to work on a project with them where I really had to instigate the project and I knew that their uh, environment was uh, under a great deal of pressure from the disappearance of native species due to the European introduction of feral animals, uh, particularly the cat, foxes and other animals as well, but most particularly the cat, uh, which in its uh, wild state over several generations grows to an enormous size. And most of our native animals in Australia are, are not carnivores, so they don't have any natural defences that they've evolved for avoiding that kind of predatory behaviour. And so we have a mass disappearance across much of Australia now of our native species. And of course, climate change is part of that as well. And the women are more aware of that even than me because they, they live out there. And many of those animals in the lifetime of, 
uh, all, of our, all of those women have just disappeared from, uh, from their environment. And the title, which translates into English as Animals from Another Time, uh, was really their title because they were, you know, creatures that were once there but, but are, are no longer. I supplied uh, British and Australian military garments to incorporate into the works. These communities have been severely affected by, well, British colonisation since the 1800s, but also more specifically in, in the 21st century, the 50s and the 60s, atomic testing that the British carried out in the desert on part of what was once their lands called Maralinga. And that was very destructive. Uh, quite a number of Aboriginal people in, in, the, in the communities in the vicinity of the testing uh, died. Other people were blinded. We had a, uh, one of the elders at our camp who would have been over 70 was orphaned by Maralinga. Uh, and it's still a no-go zone for, for, for people to go back and live because of um, uh, the radioactivity that's still there, even though the government has tried to clean it up. Uh, so their communities have been really you know, under siege uh, for a couple of hundred years in various ways. Uh, so it was actually a great opportunity for them to make work that uh, reflected upon a lot of that. And I think in, in the catalogue, one of the artists says that she thinks that the disappearance of animals is also uh, a result of the Maralinga testing, which in part would have been absolutely true. It's so strange as well driving through South Australia because so much of the state is actually govern uh, is uh, defence land as well. Exactly. And, and so much of it now is taken over by mines, by you know mining companies. And if it's Aboriginal land, then there has to be some sort of agreement about you know, the mining companies going there. But of course the mining companies buy their way in and promise that they'll leave the land as pristine as it was before and it's never like that. So the next thing I guess in a kind of, in such contrast but also in the tenderness in which you've held it is also so close is this idea of tender and the money. Well yeah, uh, globalisation uh, and, and, and indeed of course uh, wars in the, the second half of the, 21st, of, of the 20th century with Vietnam and then the Gulf War uh, and now into the 21st century uh, seem to have been, well, not entirely instigated by the USA, but they seem to have stepped in and become the ringleaders. Uh, and the greenback at the same time has been the most desirable cu uh, currency in the 20th century. Maybe that's been eroded somewhat now. Uh, particularly with the rise of, well, China as a, as a world power uh, and, and now Russia, it's quite <laughs> scary times. Uh, but, I mean, the word tender, of course, refers to the, um, the caring uh, of bird species by building nests to raise their young, but also every American dollar has written on it this notice legal tender, because money, of course, is tender. Um, so uh, it's, it's a title with a pun. So we're talking about tender and this very tender process. There's also a pretty morbid kind of, a, I mean pretty morbid, it's very gloomy, it's a dark room, there's lots of, you know, dripped paint and mm. skulls. And yes. the, the kind of, the idea that comes to mind is that idea of syncretism or this idea of voodoo, this kind of, this mashing mm. or mm. merging of many different seemingly unrelated mm. or seemingly incongruous mm. worlds. I mean, mm. Even in terms of, you're talking about South Australia and you're talking about Indigenous Australians, but you're also mm. talking about, you know, mm. Maoris and, and mm. just oil across the world. Mm. What is this version of the world which is blurred? Is it is it your world, the way you see it, or is it...? Well, I think at, at certain times and across different cultures in human history, artists and, and, and indeed writers have often felt compelled to work with quite bleak issues. I mean, certainly throughout the 20th century and in a sense the 21st century uh, is it, right now is a time of, you know, well, I can't say bleaker issues, but, 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 but as I was saying before, you know, it's not a good prognosis from my perspective of the future of the world. And so I, I think in a sense, um, uh, well, I, speaking for myself, I've attempted to draw on uh, maybe that sort of metaphorical way of, 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 in some of the works, particularly the hanging heads, for example, of trying to uh, transform, you know, the substance of uh, conflict in that case, the military garments into something which um, is 
uh, a lot more, I don't want to use the word voodoo, but has a certain kind of unsettling, hopefully those heads have a fairly sort of ghoulish unsettling aspect to them. Mm.